study was not on mental health. It was actually on relationships with other young people. But in fact, mental health, as we can see, was a very prevalent issue in these interviews. So I did this work with my supervisor, Robin Banerjee, at Sussex. And we spoke to an intensive placement team of foster carers. So this is a group of carers who take young people who have particularly pronounced issues, quite often behavioural issues, and they have a regular monthly meeting with their social workers. And we went along to that and spoke to them about the young people in their care. We also did some individual interviews with carers from the intensive placement team and then other carers who were not in that team, so who had young people perhaps with less pronounced difficulties. And we were talking to them about the peer relationships of the young people and also how the young people felt about themselves. And in talking to them, the carers really felt that it was important to recognise the experiences that young people had had with their birth families and how this had impacted on their feelings about themselves. So we have this one particular example here of the young person who really was very, very low mood, very depressed, and he felt like everyone hated him. And the carer here really linked this to what the, the birth mum had done. We also found that there was a lot of rejection by the peer group, particularly for young people who were of secondary school age. And this first quote here around not getting invited to birthday parties at school was actually very common amongst the carers that I spoke to. Birthday parties are a particularly um, social institution. They are something that is very um, obvious in the school peer group. And there seemed to be common practice of either not getting invited to other people's birthday parties or several examples of throwing a birthday party for the young person in care and no other children turning up. So birthday parties were a particularly stressful social situation for young people in care. There are also a lot of difficulties with negative self-perception, so bad feelings about themselves. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of you who have worked with young people in care will have your own stories about young people who blame themselves for what had happened. So in this case, this was the girl who felt like it was her fault that daddy had come into the room. And a boy who thought that because his sisters got adopted and he didn't, that there must be something wrong with him. So these issues here of problems with peer relationships, problematic self-perceptions, really tied into poor mental health in young people in care. If we think about those social situations and how young people interact with other children, in some cases it can be that they have problems with interpreting those situations. And we have one carer who talked to boy about a boy who said he would say things to other people that were really unkind, but he couldn't see that because he couldn't feel it and so it mustn't hurt the other person. Other young people might have what we call a hostile attribution bias, which is thinking that everything everyone else does is from a hostile intent. And that is quite natural. If you've grown up in a situation where you're in an abusive environment, you're on the lookout for any behaviours that might have hostile intent, because that is what will keep you alive. That's what helps you to survive. And this can be what develops in young people who've had abusive experiences. So here there was a young girl who felt like she was under attack all the time. And her behavioural response to that was actually to lash out and to try and get in the hurt to the other person before they hurt her. So for some young people, there are difficulties interpreting social situations. Other young people actually have good understanding of social situations. And you may have a similar experience to this carer who was able to sit down and play board games that talked about feelings and behaviours and emotions and consequences, and the young person understood. But as soon as they went into the school environment and there was the pressurised peer situation, then that triggered that threat response, that anxiety. And they went for what they called an automated response. So they went for that aggressive response. So we know that there are these difficulties that um, carers have experienced with young people. As I said earlier, no two young people are the same. And in fact, we heard some positive stories also about young people's mental health and their development. 
but we know that mental health is an issue for young, many young people in care. And so we worked with the NSPCC. They asked us to look at the mental health interventions that had been used specifically with looked after children. And we did this work with Ian Sinclair, Matt Wolger, and Judy Seber, also at the Reese Centre. And the thinking behind this report was that, well, practitioners, so people like yourselves, you need to know whether a particular intervention is likely to work with the young people who you're looking after. And so we wanted to uh, produce a report that gave an indication of the strength of the evidence for different interventions. Now, in doing so, we felt it was also important to look at the context in which those in interventions operated. So we thought about the importance of ordinary care, so the day-to-day -day experiences of young people in care as an intervention in itself. So before we think about any of these um, manualised interventions, anything where you might have a referral to a CAM service or where you might have um, training that puts you through working with young people in a particular way, the day-to-day -day experiences are important to look at as a way of supporting mental health. Some of the research evaluations of mental health interventions actually miss out the importance of context. So thinking about what it is for um, young people to be involved in these things, what other situations, what other factors that need to be in place in order for these uh, interventions to work in the best way. And we also thought it was important to think about how the quality of the care environment and the decisions that are made um, can influence well-being before you take that step of shipping in one of these interventions. So when we're talking about ordinary care, what do we mean? Well, there's a number of different things. First of all, the young person obviously has um, an influence on their own well-being, so their motivations. Do they just want to go back home? Do they want to build a relationship in the family? Do they want to get on with their peer group? And I must say that usually they do. It's not that they don't want to fit into the peer group, it's just that they might have difficulties in doing that. Foster carers are particularly important. So for young people who live in foster care, equally residential workers for those living in residential care, they need to be warm and committed and have good relationships either with their partners or with the other adults that they're working with in order to promote well-being and good mental health. There's also the interaction of the two, so the caregivers and the young people interacting together. And Ian Sinclair, who wrote this report with us, has talked before about the importance of chemistry, that you may have a match that looks perfect on paper, but actually once you get the young person and the adult together, there's something about it that just doesn't work. And that may be a case where a change of placement is not necessarily a damaging thing, because it can mean that they go into a placement where they're more likely to build a good relationship. Interactions with other young people, and the Reef Centre also wrote a review about the importance of foster carers' own families and the impact that fostering can have on them. School is an important context, and I have to say it's been overlooked quite a lot in the interventions research for mental health for young people in care. And as you all know, contact with birth families is also important. There is a lot of talk around involving young people in decisions, and sometimes that can seem a little tokenistic, but it really is important to involve them in the decisions about where they're going to live and when different actions are going to be taken in order for them to feel like they have some control over their lives and to boost their well-being. It's also important to prepare them for transitions. Traditionally, we think about that in terms of care leavers, and that is certainly a very important stage, particularly if they feel like their support is going to drop off once they've left care, but also transitions between placements and between schools. And finally, the timing of interventions is important. So it's better to be proactive, to put in an intervention in place earlier, and then it's more likely to succeed rather than wait and be firefighting further down the line when the problem has escalated. So again, it's worth thinking about which of those aspects of ordinary care you might be able to influence in your practice, and it would be good to hear from you about that. So I'm just going to mention a few of the interventions that we looked at, as well as ordinary care. We did look at these targeted interventions, and we looked for any interventions 
where there were at least two research reports published about their use with looked after children. Now there are a number of interventions out there that are used with children generally, but we were interested in how they've been used with looked after children and what result, results they had reported. We weren't looking at any adult outcomes, or just outcomes in childhood, and we managed to find over 100 of these studies. And the interventions seem to target either the carers or the young person or both together. And quite often it was the interventions that targeted emotional well-being that worked directly with the young person, whereas behavioural well-being was either with the carer or with both the carer and the young person. There are a number of them there in the report and that link that's on the first page of the slides will take you to the report. I'm just going to mention three of them today. MTFC, multidimensional treatment foster care, which came out of Oregon. You may have come across it, you may even have worked with or as an MTFC carer. It has the largest amount of published evidence in terms of an intervention for looked after children. It really is a mixed picture, I have to say, for the evidence. Now, the US results do look quite promising in terms of behavioural improvements, but most of those US papers have been written by the people who designed the programme. And that is something that we need to be slightly wary of when we're looking at research evidence. And this is why people elsewhere have also tested MTFC and have done research on it. And tests in the UK have been a little less positive. They suggest that the effect might not last. And that's partly it's suggested because an MTFC placement is designed to be quite short term. And so the young person knows that they're going to move on after that. And they may return to that old context, that old neighbourhood or environment where the behavioural issues arose. The UK tests have also shown that a low MTFC is very good for young people who are highly antisocial, which you would expect because that's the population it was designed for. It's not so good for young people who are not highly antisocial. So in the UK test, those who were antisocial at the start did much better at the end of their period in MTFC, whereas those who weren't highly antisocial at the start actually did worse than those who were in a standard foster care placement. So this is, again, thinking about it's not a one-size-fits-all policy. We also looked at mentoring schemes, and these can be quite good in terms of improving social and emotional well-being, especially when they're paired with skills training, so around social skills, for example. However, it needs to be consistent, and this is certainly the case for all of these interventions. You need a consistent approach. And in fact, this one study by Johnson and colleagues has shown that it's more damaging to receive just limited or sporadic access to a mentor rather than not having a mentor at all. So if you're going to enrol a young person in a mentoring scheme, you need to make sure that that person is going to be a consistent presence. The final one I wanted to mention was fostering changes. Again, you may have gone through this training or you may know of fostering changes. This is a 12-week program used with foster carers and it works with attachment theory and social learning theory to help carers to um, work with young people, particularly around behavioural issues. And it showed improved behavioural and emotional well-being in a pilot study. And it's at the moment being rolled out across Wales. So we're looking forward to finding out the results of that. There are some limitations in what we can say about what works for young people in care in terms of mental health interventions. A lot of the time researchers are using um, samples where they're not reporting much about their ordinary care context. So we don't know much about these young people's backgrounds. We don't know where they're living. We don't know what interventions they've had before. So they speak in generalities rather than about individual differences. Quite often they don't use very good comparison groups. So if we think back to that um, mental health prevalence study at the start where they were compared against disadvantaged young people, that's not always the case for these studies around interventions. The follow-up periods aren't always very long, so it might be just a month or a couple of months after the end of the intervention. And we need to know really whether these things have a, a lasting effect. And also it's focusing on the symptoms. 
Now, one thing to bear in mind is that the SDQ that I mentioned earlier, that Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, which you can find if you just Google SDQ, has two versions. And one of those versions actually talks about not just symptoms, but impact. So does this have a, an impact on the young person's day-to-day -day life? And it's important to think about that because two young people might get the same score on the SDQ, but for one of them, it might be much more damaging than the other. So there are certainly some promising interventions out there, but as we said, we do need to bear in mind the individual differences in young people's experiences and their reactions to those experiences. And the interventions in that case need to have the flexibility to meet those individual needs. And there needs to be some ongoing support, so not just finishing when the intervention finishes, but having some support for the carers and the young people after that. We do need to make sure that services are making the best decisions when choosing interventions. So this is a first step towards that in producing this report so that we can talk about the strength of the evidence. I think we could go further in that and it would be good to hear your thoughts about how we can do that. And another thing that we're particularly interested in is how do we ensure that any benefits of interventions carry across context? So if a young person is moving between placements or if they're receiving a home intervention, how do we ensure that the benefits carries across to school? So just to conclude then, I wanted to say that uh, all of the research I've talked about today really shows that key adults can make a difference to young people in care. It is about that relationship with foster carers, with residential workers, with social workers, with teachers, with mentors. But we can see that behaviour management on its own is not enough. It really is about developing the relationships between the young person and that key adult and between the young person and their peers. And it's about developing their understanding, both of themselves and of other people. And I just wanted to end really on making you think about this idea that things we might react to as being problem behaviours or biases in social understanding have actually developed in response to living in a dysfunctional environment. Young people are very adaptive. They'll grow up to adapt to the environment that they're in. And so they learn responses that help them to survive in very harsh conditions. And it's just when they come into the wider world, so when they come into care, that they find out those same responses, those same behaviours are not quite so adaptive in that new context. So instead of perhaps thinking of these things as negatives, we should be thinking about them as survival skills. And how do we work with young people to promote their learning of new survival skills for that new context. We do think that the key there to well-being is in the relationships with those with whom they live. And I'd really like you to think about how training and supervision and quality assurance might help to produce this good ordinary care. So I hope that you will leave the session today thinking about what you might be able to do tomorrow next week and in six months time to promote and support the mental health of young people in care but also perhaps thinking about what some of the barriers are that might be standing in your way of promoting mental health thank you thank you nikki um a very interesting uh, presentation and i'm sure um we've we've got a question in already but if you don't know how the system works and you joined us late you just need to t if you've got a question for nikki about any aspect of the presentation um any questions please if you can type your questions in there's a pane uh, on the on the right hand side there is a pane where you can actually type in your questions and we'll pick those up but if you want to start, Nikki, um, we've got a question about, do you have any thoughts, because um, ultimately you've been talking about uh, the actual interventions with young people directly, but do you have any thoughts about what types of support foster carers might need to manage and support mental health effectively? Hmm. So some of the, yeah, as I mentioned, a, a number of the interventions that we looked at were actually working directly with foster carers, so things like fostering changes, fostering attachments, we're all working with carers to think about generally how they might work with young people to develop 
relationships, to develop attachment, to develop well-being. And that was well-being in its broadest sense in terms of behavioral well-being, but also social and emotional well-being. But getting the ordinary care right before we think about those kind of training programs, I think is a really crucial thing. And it's thinking about how foster carers might be supported to recognize some of the signs of poor well-being in young people. Great. Uh, I've got a question here from Geraldine Buckley. Um, she's interested in fostering changes program in Wales and wants to know what local authorities are involved in this, if you're able to answer that. I can't answer that, I'm afraid. Um, I'm not involved in the, the rollout of it, but it's something that has been funded through um, the Welsh, and let me think, the Welsh uh, government, I think, is funding that research. But you could get in touch with, um, let me get the contact details for you. It was developed, Foster and Changes were developed through the South London and Maudsley team. So it was Stephen Scott there who developed it. And you may have come across Stephen Scott's work before. Um, so they've been involved certainly in handing that on to the Welsh implementation team. I'm not sure what stage that um, trial is at at the moment. Um, but I can get some uh, contact details on that for you. I can get in touch with Stephen and, and find out who would be the best person for you to find out about that from Geraldine. Um, and we can get that sent out. I can add this on to the, um, the slides at the end, if that's all right. That's lovely. Um, I mean, Judy has, has actually said contact Cascade for information on this funded oh. by the big lottery. Okay. Also, Geraldine said thank you for your response. <laughs> um, Cascade University of Cardiff can tell you yeah. all about it. So it's, we're getting some interesting help. For, thank you very much. To, Thanks, to Judy. <laughs> answering questions here. I've got a, uh, a question from Rebecca Spencer-Smith. She's asking, have the benefits of counselling services for young people in care been researched? And if so, uh, what are the outcomes? Not specifically for young people in care, no. So as I said, um, there are a number of interventions that would be used generally with any young people who were showing well-being or mental health issues. Um, and they haven't been researched specifically with young people in care. So things like counselling, we don't have, or we certainly we couldn't find two or more research reports that talked about counselling specifically. There were things like life story work. So one of the things that's in the review is around potential benefits of life story work. Now, the research that's been done around that has been very small scale. Um, in some cases, it's concentrated on the foster carers rather than the young people. Again, it's something that looks quite promising, but I think we'd need a, a larger um, piece of research around the benefits of life story work. But that, that's obviously a specific kind of work that's done with young people. But more general mental health counselling, no, it hasn't been um, researched, um, certainly not widely researched with young people in care. And we don't know at the moment about the different types of counselling as well. Um, for young people in care and I'm thinking specifically there around school counsellors because there was a real lack of school-based interventions that we could find in the research for young people in care. And that sounds like an area for our academics and um, yeah. to sort of think about putting a proposal maybe for future uh, research. Yeah. I've got a question here for from Claire Owens. How important is the role of social worker in supporting the foster carer to understand the emotional well-being needs of children that they care for? I think it's really important. Thanks, Claire, for that question. Um, I do think it's really important. I mean, what we know is um, not just from the mentoring research, but across research within people in care that consistency, first of all, is um, very important. Now, in some cases, young people will only have one consistent presence in their lives, and that may be a social worker or a carer, or it might be a teacher at school. So certainly where there are consistent relationships and supportive relationships between the social worker and the carer, that is very important. What we also know is that any training that is offered to multiple groups, so in some cases, um, some of this training has been offered to both foster carers and social workers. And that seems to have a particular benefit because what it means is that they are learning about each other's roles 
and how they can actually work together to support the young person's mental health, rather than it being a case of both receiving their training separately and then having that perhaps phone or meeting contact in between and, and not really having that social understanding, which is exactly what I talked about with some of these young people who had social difficulties. You need to develop that understanding of each other's roles and, and some of the pressures that each other is going through. Um, and I think for that reason, it is really important for the social workers and the carers to work together. Thank you. Uh, I've got a comment here and a question from Geraldine Buckley. Um, I find it always very difficult to get schools on board in respect of understanding a foster child's emotional needs and adjusting their approaches. Uh, and she wants to ask, have you used or know of a particular program which works? Uh, that's a, Maybe a magic bullet question there. <laughs> that's definitely a magic bullet question. If we're talking about what works, and I have to say that was the question NSPCC originally posed to us, what works for mental health and care? Um, and in reviewing the evidence, we had to um, say, actually, I wish we could give you a magic bullet answer, but in fact, there are so many things to take into consideration. In terms of school evidence, there's only one um, intervention that we found um, in the research that was school-based. This was another one from the Oregon team who developed MTFC, and it's called Middle School Success. So it was um, targeted at young people who were making the transition to the middle school system in the US. And that did seem to have some benefits. Um, whether or not it would carry across to the UK, I don't know. And again, that's around something very specific, so it's about transitioning to a new school. I think you're not the first person who have said that it's difficult to get schools on board um, with supporting emotional well-being. There is a big drive at the moment for attachment awareness, so attachment and trauma awareness in schools. And there are a number of programs going on around the country to try and support that. Um, at the Reece Centre, we're working with Bath and North East Somerset Local Authority and Bath Spa University, and we're looking at a programme they've developed, which is training in attachment awareness. Um, and that is a training programme for schools and for carers that they're running. So we're just in the middle of an evaluation of that actually at the moment. So I can't say at the moment whether it works or not. We, we should have the answers uh, on that. Um, probably sometime next year um, but at the moment it's, it really is um, the task of researchers and academics to work with the people who are designing and delivering these different programs to see whether or not they're working I don't think it's a reluctance on the behalf on the sorry I don't think it's a reluctance on the part of the people delivering programs to be evaluated far from it um, so I think the task is for researchers to make that link um, so that we can get some evaluation around those things. We've got a, a very interesting question here from Diane Heath. Um, see what you think of this. You know, where does the notion of emotional intelligence fit with any of the interventions, if at all? Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, so that was, um, as I said at the end there, about the importance of not just behaviour management, but actually developing an understanding of yourself and other people. And emotional intelligence is, is very much at the heart of that. So it's understanding why, you know, the young person understanding why they might have a particular emotional reaction to a situation, how that can manifest itself in certain behaviours, but also understanding what other people's emotional reactions might be to their own behaviour. As I said, for some young people, that can be quite a problem, um, and that is something that carers will need to work with them on. For other young people, they might have actually quite good emotional intelligence, quite good social understanding, but they might have what a lot of carers have called a default response when they get into a pressurised situation. So once they get into that peer group, once they get into the school playground, it might be difficult for them to switch off that default response. So I think it's um, one of the things that I am particularly interested in is this idea of emotion regulation so that actually a, a young person needs to learn how to calm themselves and needs to learn how not to react very quickly to a situation so that they can then take that step back and do that social processing, that information processing of the situation that will help them have the adaptive response. Now that is something that if you think about very young children, babies learn that emotion regulation um, in their relationship with their parents usually. 
And it's something that we take for granted in older children, that once they've passed uh, the terrible twos, that they're not going to have those outbursts quite so much. But for young people in care, obviously they might have had a particularly dysfunctional relationship with parents, and so they're not going to have learned that at a younger age. So it really is about thinking about how we develop that side of emotion regulation in young people. I've got a question here from Geraldine Buckley, um, and she wanted to know what your opinion was on Dan Hughes' model of PACE as a model of parenting children with emotional and behavioural issues. I don't know it in great detail. I know that it's something that um, Louise Bomber is, is using in her work, uh, her attachment aware work in schools. Um, I've heard anecdotally good reports about it, but actually Dan Hughes's work we couldn't find. Again, because he's something I'm, somebody whose name I've heard quite a lot, I thought that there would be a lot of research around his approach. There's not, so it's, it's not really been evaluated as such in terms of research and, and whether it works. Um, I think, as I say, anecdotally, I know from carers, a lot of carers do find it helpful. Whether it's making a difference, I don't know. I've got an interesting question here from Rebecca Smith, uh, Spencer Smith. Um, have you found that labels such as personality disorder or ADHD, etc., have been too readily applied to young people in care? Mm -hmm. thoughts on that? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I wish I could have Matt Wolgar, my co-author, on, uh, on the webinar with me today, um, because actually I think he would take a slightly different view of it. I think there are, there are two sides to this. So one side is that um, carers and professionals in the, in the care system are obviously very ready to spot any difficulties in young people, and perhaps more so than birth families would be with their own children. So we're always on the lookout for potential problems with young people in care. So it may be that there is some over-labeling done in that case. Um, however, I know that what, uh, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I know, I've know i heard Matt say several times before, um, that young people who are in care can often be mislabeled um, as having, for example, attachment issues, when what they have is a difficulty that many other young people would have. Now obviously there are some things that are unique about young people in care, the experiences of coming into care, being removed from families and communities, the experiences of being in contact with a number of professionals daily, with being moved from placement to placement, with having little control over their own lives. All of these things are unique to young people in care and so we might expect to have some differences in terms of the mental health issues that arise. However, Matt has, has often spoken about in his personal clinical experience um, stories about young people who have shown symptoms or shown behavioural issues that in a young person in the general population would be diagnosed in one way, perhaps as an anxiety disorder or as ADHD or as a potentially autism spectrum disorder. And yet, those same symptoms, those same indicators for a young person in care will be seen as an indication of trauma, of attachment difficulties, of attachment disorders. And so the same set of symptoms can end up with a different label for somebody who's in care than for someone who's in the general population. So I think there are two different sides to that, one of which is the, the perhaps, yes, oversensitivity to, to difficulties, and the other side is perhaps the mislabeling. I've got a final, there's sort of mini questions here, so there's three questions in one from Claire Owens. Um, how do we get children and young people to understand evidence-based interventions? That's the first part of the question, I'll come back to it again. Um, and did you find any instances of children and young people asking for a particular type of help that might not be the right help for them? And also, how far do we give these children and carers choice? So let's start with the first one. How, how do we get children and young people to understand evidence-based interventions? So getting them to understand the important, I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether to interpret this as getting them to understand the importance of evidence-based interventions or getting them to understand that there is well, maybe evidence. Maybe take the two questions together. Works, but, 
Yeah. I'm interpreting your question, Claire, here. Um, <laughs> so how do we get children and young people to understand evidence-based interventions, and did you find any instances of children and young people asking for a particular type of help that might not have been the right help for them? So I suppose if we take them in hand. Yeah. I mean, I have to say that in the research reports, um, and this is it, this is something that uh, a lot of us as, as academics, unfortunately, are, are guilty of, is that it was more a case of something being done to the young person, in the sense that in a lot of cases, they didn't have the choice of the intervention. It was that an issue had been identified, and that this particular intervention was what was being tried out at the time, and it was part of a research project. Um, in terms of having choice around it, I, I guess there may be some clinical research around that, but there's not, there, there wasn't anything that came up that was specific research about the choices that young people made. What there was that I found that actually didn't um, particularly make it into the report in any great depth was some information around engagement of young people with mental health services. So that might fit in more with the how to how do you get them to understand evidence-based interventions so this wasn't around them choosing a particular intervention but this was around whether or not they would engage with interventions and part of that was actually giving them choice so in order to engage young people with mental health services it is important to give them some choice it's important as they're doing as part of the um IAPT, the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies for Young People um, in England, they are um, getting the young people at the start, very start of those journeys to set their own goals. So what improvements do they want to make by the end of it? And I think that's a really important part of that IAPT service, is that rather than, as we have in a lot of these research reports, the adults, the professionals around them are setting the kind of standard for what do we mean by improvement, what do we mean by recovery, what are the indicators and outcomes that we're going to be on the lookout for. Instead of the adults making those decisions, actually the young people are. So I think that's a, a big part of it, and I'd love to see more of that in the research, getting the young people to set their own targets, what, what does well-being mean. And also, um, as I said, that there is the importance of giving them choice, but that's not something that we found in the research. Okay, I hope that partly answers your question, Claire, or answers fully your questions. We're going to have to sort of bring proceedings to a close. I mean, it's amazing how time flies, and we want to thank you, you know, for your interest to the audience and diverse questions and comments, and also to you, Nikki, because I've been firing questions at you <laughs> uh, um, for answering so eloquently and in, in such detail. Um, and you've not been flustered by one question, which is, which is amazing, because if, if I was asked those questions, I think I would be floundering. <laughs> so we hope you all enjoyed the presentation and the questions and the answer session today. Um, so a big thanks to everybody. Uh, what, the, what will happen after this webinar, there'll be a follow-up email. Um, and you'll also have uh, an opportunity to provide feedback and comments, you know, We'd love to hear from you. And so on behalf of the National Children's Bureau and the Children's Partnership and our great presenter, Nikki Luke, thank you, Nikki. Thank, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>